welcome to episode 20 of Ping, a Firewalls.com podcast, a bi-weekly look at cybersecurity, including interviews, news, expert tips, and the latest trends. I'm Kevin Baxter, and I'm joined by my Firewalls.com colleague, Andrew Harmon. Hey. Hey, Andrew. As we tackle a different featured topic each episode. New editions are out every other Wednesday, so subscribe or follow on your favorite podcasting platform to get the latest first. Please rate and review us, and you can drop us a line anytime at podcast at firewalls.com if you have questions or comments. As always, thanks for listening, and now it's time to get into our featured topic and introduce our guest for this episode. Our wireless world is evolving. A couple episodes back, we discussed the government's approval to open up a new channel on the wireless spectrum. The 6 gigahertz band will soon be open for business, and while it's clear that's good news for Wi-Fi speed and reliability, what does this expansion mean for individuals and business users? And how can they take advantage of the opportunity? We thought we'd turn to an expert to get some perspective on these questions, plus some other wireless issues related to our current climate. We're joined by Sundar Sankaran, VP of Engineering with Comscope's Ruckus Networks. Sundar, thanks very much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Kevin. Before we get started, we like to get to know our guests a little bit. So could you tell us a little bit about uh, what your day-to-day is like on your job? Sure, Kevin. As you said, I am am with the Ruckus Business Unit that's part of Comscope. I usually work out of the Sunnyvale office here, but today, like many of us, I'm working from my home. I work with a very talented team of engineers that are responsible for designing and developing Wi-Fi access point software and hardware. We take pride in building products that are easy to deploy, easy to manage, easy to troubleshoot, and deliver exceptional connectivity experience for our end users. So we know Comscope is pretty famous for its diverse wireless network offerings, a a wide range of APs and network switches and so forth, including the Ruckus brand following your guys' 2019 acquisition of Eris. Wi-Fi is very vital for a functioning network environment, as we all know. And since work is now spread out quite a bit uh, under the current climate, how have you and your colleagues been called upon to connect places that maybe weren't previously connected? Yeah, as you said, we are in an unprecedented time right now. People are constrained to be physically apart due to this concerns for public safety. Reliable networking is key to stay connected, continue working, continue learning, continue receiving healthcare, and so on. Connectivity has really become a critical lifeline for our healthcare providers, our teachers, and our governments. As a networking technology leader, Comscope has been working with various nonprofit organizations to provide connectivity wherever it is needed during these challenging times. In China, Europe, and the US, Comscope has donated products, expedited delivery of in building wireless systems to new hospitals that were built to support COVID 19 patients. In conjunction with Information Technology Disaster Resource Center, or ITDRC, Comscope donated outdoor wireless access points and switches to assist with pop-up centers for emergency healthcare delivery, as well as homework hotspots. Comscope employees are also volunteering their time at some of these outdoor COVID-19 test sites and homework hotspots to set up connectivity. Comscope is also working with school districts, partners, and service providers to extend coverage outdoors and equip school buses with outdoor access points with LTE backhaul. Then these buses can be parked in strategic locations so that students can connect to the internet to complete their schoolwork. This proof of concept has already been implemented in Indiana and Pennsylvania and it is being explored by additional school districts throughout the U.S. That's really interesting. Uh, I, I know that uh, you mentioned that you're working from home. We're we're working from home as well, and we know that schools are doing the same. That's an interesting method to be able to uh, provide that connectivity because, as we know, there are certain people who may struggle to have connectivity in certain places. We are actually ourselves based here in Indiana, so I'll have to keep an eye out for one of these uh, Wi-Fi buses that you mentioned see how they are around the community. Yeah. I'm sure you will run into them soon, Andrew and Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> 
So you mentioned uh, temporary hospitals as well. And we, we talked recently about a news story for temporary hospitals having some cybersecurity challenges needing to pop up very quickly and get connected very quickly. So how has Comscope been involved in not only getting these types of facilities connected and up and running, but also helping them to stay secure? As you can imagine, security is a top priority for Comscope and also for our customers. We provide many different options to secure the network. You know, I have to start by saying that Wi-Fi security has come a long way from the days of this wired equivalent privacy or web it was a protocol that you know the daily day devices used. Unfortunately, web was a complete failure, but that failure led to the development of today's secure Wi-Fi protocols. Today we have these newer WPA2 and WPA3 protocols. These use AES encryption that is actually FIPS 140-2 compliant. That means it's it meets the security requirements for the federal government agencies. Uh, let me also talk a bit more about the latest and greatest WPA3, which was introduced in 2018 and starting 2019, it's mandatory for, especially for these Wi-Fi 6 devices. These WPA3 standards support much longer keys that future proofs Wi-Fi security against crack threats from high performance computers such as quantum computers. More interestingly, this protocol supports a new feature called opportunistic wireless encryption or OWE, which means even the connections that use open SSIDs are encrypted. You know, you could be connected to an open SSID, I will be connected to an open SSID. The system will create an encrypted tunnel for each of us. I cannot sniff your traffic, you cannot sniff my traffic. So it's great, you know, you still are able to connect without an SSID, but it's all encrypted. Our access points, Comscope access points, support all these flavors of Wi-Fi security, including the latest and greatest WPA3. Apart from this, we have the option to assign different set of users to different VLANs. You know, going back to the temporary hospital example that you cited, you know, you can assign the nurses and doctors their official devices to one VLAN, their personal devices could be on a different VLAN, the staff could be on a third VLAN, and the patients will be on a totally different VLAN. That means you have another layer of security to make sure that only the right set of people have access to the right data with the right devices. Yeah, so that defense in depth strategy that we talk about a whole lot seems to be carrying over here as well. You know, shifting gears just a little bit, the big news we mentioned in the Wi-Fi space is the FCC's decision to open up the 6 gigahertz spectrum. What's this mean exactly for individuals and businesses? What changes will they see? You're right. Late April, FCC voted unanimously to open up 1.2 gigahertz of spectrum in the six gigahertz band for unlicensed Wi-Fi use. To put this in perspective, today, as you know, Wi-Fi operates in 2.4 gig and 5 gig band, which combined together has less than 600 megahertz of spectrum. Now, FCC has opened up 1.2 gigahertz of spectrum. That means the new spectrum that has been made available to Wi-Fi is more than double of what we currently use. Another way to think about this is if you're used to driving in a two-lane highway to work, soon it's going to be expanded into a six-lane highway. There is more to this story than just increasing the number of lanes. I actually grew up in a densely populated town in India. That town had very narrow streets. Uh, it's not just that roads were narrow. You'll see all forms of transportation on those streets, ranging from bicyclists to motorcyclists to cars and even pedestrians. So even if you have a fancy sports car, you cannot drive fast because the pedestrians and bicyclists will slow you down. Now, imagine that I'm going to expand the number of lanes on those streets and restrict them only to cars. Then the sports car that you have can make full use of their potential and go very fast. That's very much analogous to what's going to happen in the 6 gigahertz band. In 2.4 gig and 5 gig band, we have all generation of Wi-Fi devices ranging from the latest and greatest Wi-Fi 6 to devices that are based on older generation of standards such as E211, A, B, G, or N. In reality, those old generation devices are preventing Wi-Fi 6 devices from reaching their full potential. In the 6 gigahertz band, on the other hand, 
just like we prevented bicyclists and pedestrians to come into the narrow streets in India, we are going to let only five, five, six devices to come in, which is great because these devices can operate very efficiently at very high speeds with very low latency without getting bogged down by these legacy devices. These Wi-Fi 6 devices that are capable of operating in 6 gigahertz band, they are called Wi-Fi 6E devices. E here stands for extended. Basically, Wi-Fi 6 is getting extended into the 6 gigahertz spectrum. Effectively, the overall Wi-Fi user experience is going to significantly get better with the 6 gigahertz spectrum opening up. That same metaphor, having less sports cars on the streets, also opens up more space for the bicyclists and pedestrians. So uh, you see those lower bands clearing out a little bit as well as more of the newer devices are moving up to that new six band. That's very true. 2.4 gig and 5 gig also become more usable because, as you point out, the newer devices are moving away. We've been in this 2.4 and 5 gigahertz band for quite some time. So why is it so important now to really get this expansion underway? You know, this is going to benefit in several use cases. For example, if you think of scenarios where there are lots of access points and they're all densely packed, the 6 gigahertz is going to make a huge difference. For example, if you live in an MDU, every unit in an MDU has their own access point. Or if you think of a stadium, to meet the capacity requirement, several hundred access points get deployed. In such two deployments, what happens is Wi-Fi performance is largely constrained by the co-channel interference because I have many, many access points, but only limited number of channels, just like limited number of lanes in the streets. With this new spectrum opening up, you're going to have a lot more channels, which means each AP can operate in a different channel and it's going to reduce the interference by a lot, which means in these high-density deployments, user experience is going to get a lot better. Another application that's going to benefit from Wi-Fi 6E is AR-VR, which requires very high throughput as well as low latency. So Wi-Fi 6E proves to be a nice option for providing connectivity to those devices. This, we believe, will accelerate adoption of AR-VR devices uh, it will also improve imaging in telemedicine. It will also bolster support for long-term healthcare services. Also, nowadays, many homes use mesh. Now, 6 gigahertz has very high throughput because we have very wide bandwidth available there as well. 6 gigahertz Wi-Fi would be an ideal candidate to connect those mesh APs and root APs. So there are several benefits we are going to gain out of this 6 gigahertz spectrum. So in coverage of the new Wi-Fi 6E as it's been designated, it's noted that manufacturers have already been prepping for this technology to take advantage of the added spectrum space when they're designing new products. Uh, will Comsco products be incorporating this capability going forward? Definitely. You know, 6 gigahertz is the next frontier in Wi-Fi. Yeah, Comsco, we love to push the boundaries of communication technology to create world's most advanced networks. In that spirit, we have already started building products that can make use of this 6 gigahertz spectrum. With that, we've read a few different pieces that have discussed these types of products hitting the market later in the year, early next year. Is that what you're looking at too for Comscope? Yes. You know, we're about 6 to 12 months from seeing our Wi-Fi 6E solutions in the market. Uh, you'll first see products in the consumer space, you know, later the enterprise space products will show up. What do you suggest people do to learn more in the meantime as they uh, prepare for this rollout? You know, I am a big proponent of Wi-Fi 6E, but I want to set realistic expectations. It's going to take some time for the ecosystem to build up. We expect to see about 30% penetration by 2022, but it won't be until 2023 until everyone starts to experience Wi-Fi 6E. So if somebody was thinking about making a purchase right now to you know, upgrade their wireless capabilities, it's not necessarily the best idea to just hold out. You'd suggest still moving forward with maybe a Wi-Fi 6 device or something of that nature? If you need something today because you're working from home, uh, you know, you should go ahead and get Wi-Fi 6 products. If you have time to wait and future-proof, Yes, you can wait, but if there is a need today, you are better off going and buying a Wi-Fi 6 device and start making use of that, start using that.
So over the years, in some ways, the wireless spectrum has been somewhat slow to change too, right? I mean, you, you talked about the fact that this is basically tripling available space. How big is this just, you know, as somebody who's been involved in the industry for a while, how kind of monumental is this particular change in terms of Wi-Fi access moving forward? You know, this spectrum is right next to the 5 gigahertz spectrum that we are already used to. So building radio and products to operate in that spectrum is very easy. There are incumbents in that spectrum. The FCC has come up with rules on how to coexist with those incumbents. Other than that, it's a huge chunk of spectrum that's pretty clean. So having devices in that clean spectrum is going to be a huge benefit. And you know everyone will see that benefit in terms of newer and newer applications getting enabled with Wi-Fi and significant improvement in the overall user experience. Well, uh, Sundar, thanks very much for joining us today. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. It was fun talking to you. That's great. Great discussion. I appreciate it. Now it's time for headlines. In this regular segment, we discuss a few top news stories in the network security world and what they may mean to you. We'll jump right into headline number one. Home Chef confirms data breach after 8 million user records found on the dark web. So you may have heard by now of meal kit delivery services. There are just a, a few of those out there. Andrew, have you, you ever used a meal kit delivery service? I actually have never used one. I, I don't want to say that out loud because I feel like my Facebook's going to be blowing up with offers now. <laughs> I think it will. Yeah, I, I have not either. I've considered it in the past. I, I do a lot of cooking myself, but I have not had the pleasure of trying one of these. I know many, many, many of them are out there and many, many people use them. And if you are one of those people who has used Home Chef in particular, it's possible that hackers know about it too. Home Chef has confirmed a data breach two weeks after the aforementioned 8 million customer records showed up for sale on the dark web. Customer names, phone numbers, home addresses, email addresses, uh, scrambled password tokens, and also, of course, the cherry on top is the last four digits of the user's credit card. So this is a, a fairly large haul. Yeah, not scrambled egg recipes, scrambled passwords. And also yes. <laughs> gender and age uh, of the individuals as well. So that's a lot. Home Chef says not all of its customers are affected. And if you are one of those customers who is affected, the company says it will notify you. But yeah, as you said, that's a lot of data that uh, a lot of people would like to have. Yes, uh, the data was up for bid, as you said, on the dark web. The name of the seller was Shiny Hunters. This is a group that's been in the news a lot over the last several months, gaining some attention. They recently claimed to have hacked Microsoft's GitHub repository. So far, the claim is unverified, but potentially they are looking to release this data publicly for free as yeah. opposed to selling it as they did with uh, Home Chef and, and a few others. Yeah, quite a few others. Home Chef is, is kind of the tip of the iceberg here. Listings from 10 other companies were for sale on the dark web at the same time. The listings, again, claim to include customer databases for these companies, including 30 million records allegedly taken from dating site Zeus and a lot of other companies too. A couple of the other ones have also acknowledged a breach, the Chronicle of Higher Education and Chat Books, which had a combined 18 million user records listed for sale, both acknowledged a breach as well. So you got to think the fact that even though not all of the companies noted here have acknowledged that they've been breached, the fact that three out of the uh, 11 listed have suggests that there's probably some fire with the smoke. Right. Uh, and speaking of these other companies, I actually did a little digging to find how much these records were being sold for by Shiny Hunters. So let's start with the $8 million from Home Chef. It's being sold for $2,500. Yeah. Uh, does that number surprise you? Lower? Higher than you expected? 
Um, you know, I've never shopped in the market for data, so uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, I really never really done any pricing on my own. Yeah, no, I, I definitely would need to do some comparison shopping before I would uh, say whether I was getting a deal or not for twenty five hundred. But yeah, it, there is actually a, a whole chart of uh, how much the data is being sold for, and I guess it must also have to do with the quality of the information or the amount of information that uh, they are able to steal because I mentioned Zeusk earlier. That's a uh, 30 million user records where we're talking about 8 million for Home Chef. And yet that one uh, is only going for 500 bucks. So Well, then you just get 30 million records that people are very into travel. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I don't know if maybe they just have less information from some of these and that's why the cost is less even though there's more actual records. Who knows? But yeah, it was interesting to get a little glimpse into into that market. And that's not something that I had uh, seen before. Yeah, I've, uh, I've never been to that particular action myself. <laughs> One other thing to note. So we talked about the fact that the passwords that were leaked were encrypted, so they were scrambled. Hackers can still use programs to decrypt those scrambled passwords. So for those of you who may have been affected by this Home Chef breach, for instance, the recommendation still is to immediately change your password to a strong and unique one. And a reminder that we've we've mentioned before here on the podcast that if you have the same password on a bunch of different sites, make sure you don't anymore, especially <laughs> if you've uh, potentially been exposed here. Especially if you've been getting your meals delivered. <laughs> right. Because if that same password was used at, an, at another site, you know, hackers know that people do that too. And they uh, know that people use the same emails and same usernames and same passwords across the web. And they might be able to get into some other accounts just by getting your Home Chef password. So be a little careful with that. And when, when changing your passwords, again, use a unique and strong password. Uh, at every site that you go to, we've talked about on the podcast before using a password manager. Very good idea. On to headline number two. Crypto faithful freak out amid speculation Satoshi sold Bitcoin. Some of that headline might be a foreign language to some people, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> crypto Twitter, as it was called, I, I enjoyed the uh, beginning, uh, the lead of this particular story. Crypto Twitter was ablaze. How do you feel about being alive during a time where crypto Twitter's a thing? <laughs> yeah, I had never heard it referred to that way before, but I mean, you do hear things like that come out from time to time. Film Twitter, sports Twitter, <laughs> wrestling Twitter. The uh, Twitter sphere is ablaze. Yeah, <laughs> but ablaze is such a, such a wonderful word. But uh, after the sale of some Bitcoin was being linked to the account of the token's mystery founder, who goes by the pseudonym Satoshi Nakamoto. So, yes, and this is particularly notable because this will be some of the first Bitcoins ever mined back from early 2009, September 2009. So has to be one of the founding members, supposedly, or at least somebody that was involved very, very early on with Bitcoin's life. Yes, and people on crypto Twitter, some apparently, according to this article, perceived this transaction as a near a sacrilegious offense. So the fact that crypto Twitter was ablaze also meant that the price of Bitcoin and some other cryptocurrency took a big drop. We're talking like 4% for Bitcoin over the course of the day when this news broke. Yeah. And then as you said, also um, some other coins on the market like Litecoin and Bitcoin Cash also showed very heavy sell-offs following this news. So it seems to have created a, quite a panic. Yeah. And as we know, in any kind of trading market, smoke is all you need. I talked about fire there <laughs> being with the smoke, with the hack that we talked about in the data breach uh, in our previous story. But in this one, a lot of times all you need is the smoke to have some big gains or losses one way or the other. Right. So the last such sale of this kind of these very early Bitcoin mined coins was in August 2017. So while this is rare, it's not completely unheard of. Yeah, not unprecedented. And according to some, uh, a few different experts, there are a decent number of people who could have been uh, involved in a transaction like this. But the fact that it could be Satoshi was a big deal for the followers of cryptocurrency. <laughs> Bitcoin was created 
on Halloween of 2008 through the publication of a research paper by the person who goes by the name of Satoshi Nakamoto. It was titled The Bitcoin A Peer-to-Peer Electronic Cash System. But uh, Satoshi's true identity has never been revealed. So that's uh, 11 years or 12 years ago now, and still nobody knows who it is. Right. And that's a pretty important note to the story is that all of this is just speculation because none of it can be proven. Uh, nobody knows who Satoshi is. And for all we know, he could be dead and no longer having access to any wallets. One of the original Bitcoin miners that claims that the announcement of Bitcoin was initially sent out through a cryptography mailing list earlier than the September 2009 coins were mined. So potentially... This could be hundreds or thousands of early adopters who, you know, hopped on from that mailing list and any time between, you know, May or April of 2009 and September of 2009 could have been mining the coins in question here. So this is all speculation. It may, may not be Satoshi. Nobody's quite sure. Right. It's interesting because we talked recently, we did our update on the Quadriga crypto exchange story, which had plenty of intrigue of its own. Just the origin of Bitcoin, I had not realized had such intrigue as well. I was a little bit aware that there was some strangeness behind it, but I myself had also not really looked into it. Yeah, and you mentioned the fact that some people think that the person going by Satoshi Nakamoto may have died already even. The founder of Quantum Economics, Matty Greenspan, was uh, interviewed in this story He said, I suppose we all just assumed that SN had already passed away, but uh, for this community that often resembles a religion of sorts, resurrection shouldn't be ruled out too hastily. So another strong quote there, I would say. Right. Um, Another person quoted as well, David Tewill here, president of ProChain Capital. He said that while speculation may be running high, it's possible that Satoshi's identity does stay secret or as state secret until well after his or her death. So ascribing anything, previous, current, action, identity, or otherwise, he says, is just a waste of time. On to headline number three. Virtual cybersecurity school teaches kids to fix security flaws and hunt down hackers. So we've talked before about the dearth of talent coming through the cybersecurity field with companies struggling to fill open positions. The school noted in this article is trying to prime the pump of this pipeline, if you will. Did you just come up with that? I did. Yeah, I wrote that myself. Okay. So uh, (laughs) uh, the UK originally created this virtual school as sort of a just a training course called the Cyber Discovery Program aimed at getting school-aged children interested in things like digital forensics and cryptography and other IT security skills. Like you said, there is that skills gap and this was a government initiative aimed at trying to shore that up a little bit and start getting the younger generations prepared for these types of careers early. Yeah, and it's funded by the UK government and started as a physical sort of course, but now, for some reason, becoming a virtual cyber school as well. Yeah, the timing, of course, with schools not being in session and people not being able to gather. And, of course, this type of coursework seems to really lend itself to this kind of uh, virtual setup. Yes, so this was partially founded with help from the SANS Institute. A name should be familiar to anybody in the network security space. The SANS Institute is a cybersecurity training and research institute that is on the cutting edge of trying to get cybersecurity standards increased, um, learn more about how hacks happen and why, and get people prepared to address these. And so this program was designed in kind of a game type format. So there's lessons and there's games meant to teach users how to do things like fix security flaws on web pages, uncover trails left by cyber criminals and uh, decrypt codes that are used by hackers. It's got webinars, teacher-led sessions, but the game aspect includes players taking on roles of a a cyber protection agent who uncovers real-world-like vulnerabilities on websites. Or they uh, might actually have found the the culprit behind maybe one of those data breaches where data is for sale on the dark web. The sort of gamification of complex subjects in network security is a great way to break it down and get kids interested. I've seen similar things with healthcare, with medical research, where they've turned pathogen identification into games and so forth. So this seems to be well-tested and probably very effective moving forward. 
the program is available online for any student ages 13 to 18 in the UK for free. And it costs $100 a year for uh, any student in that age group in the U.S. So uh, more than 8,000 middle and high school students have enrolled since the virtual version was announced a couple weeks back. And the school is expecting about 20,000 total enrollees. Yeah, it's a uh, hundred dollars a year is very, very affordable as well. So uh, definitely yeah. great opportunity there. Yeah, and going back to what we were talking about with the lack of talent to fill a pretty decent chunk of positions, the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics projects a 32 percent increase in entry level information security analyst jobs from 2018 to 2028, and the typical growth rate for all occupations is five percent for the same time frame. So even if there wasn't a shortage now, which there is, <laughs> that shortage is probably only going to be growing exponentially over the next several years. Yeah, so uh, hopefully this will become a model for quite a few other similar spinoffs that will get more and more of the younger generation interested in cybersecurity. They spotlight a student in this article. He's 17 now, Christopher Body. He started at the school when he was 14, and he, he says he was always interested in computers and coding, but not specifically cybersecurity. Now he says he's, he's taking it seriously and noticed that it's a, a pretty good uh, career option going forward. Yeah, now they just need a, a celebrity mascot to make cybersecurity cool. <laughs> Any suggestions? Ah, oh, boy. <laughs> David Duchovny, maybe. There you go. Yeah, I think all the kids are into David Duchovny nowadays. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for listening to this episode of Ping, a Firewalls.com podcast. And thanks again to Sundar Sankaran for joining us to talk wireless. Check out the links in the description to get more info about everything we discussed. And please do visit our blog at Firewalls.com slash blog. Subscribe or follow now to ensure you get the latest episodes as soon as they're available, and please do rate and review us wherever you listen to the podcast. Visit firewalls.com for all your network security needs and give us a follow on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. For Andrew Harmon, I'm Kevin Baxter. We'll be back soon with another episode, but in the meantime, we remind you to... It's secure. secure. Stay, Stay secure. secure.